The greatest counterfeiter of all time, Arthur Williams, was able to produce millions of fake bills. Could you believe that this man was taken into custody while carrying a suitcase containing $60,000 worth of cash? However, he was able to escape this situation with ease, and his teenage son ultimately revealed him. A story full of intriguing incidents, detective investigations, forgeries, and numerous other incidents. The hero of today's story is Arthur Williams II, is one of the greatest money forgers in the US and the only one who managed to make a copy of the $1 bill. Arthur entered the world of crime at an early age. His first crime was breaking car parking counters to buy groceries and help his mother. When he returned home one day and discovered the refrigerator was empty, he became upset and began to wonder about their life circumstances and the reasons they were so impoverished. In a state of oppression, he went for a walk. As he was crossing the street, he came across a car parking counter. In order to vent his rage, he beat it, and as he did so, he heard the sound of coins inside. He believed he could simply take the money if he could just find a way to open the counter. He persisted in messing with the counter in an effort to open it, and eventually, he was able to slip a tiny piece of iron into the lock hole and begin rotating it right and left until it was unlocked. He then collected all the coins, went to the store, and made all the necessary purchases. When his mother came back home, she was surprised. She asked him about the source of all these things. He told her that he broke a car parking counter. His mother didn't accept the fact that his son would steal to provide for her, so she got mad at him. The main reason for their financial situation was his father who left them in 1983 when Arthur was only 11 years old. This was one of the biggest shocks in his life. At that time, they could not pay for rent, so they had to leave their home and live for a while in a shelter for the homeless. Their only goal was to survive. Over time, they were moved to one of the government-backed housing projects. This was a dark period in Arthur's life. And whenever he saw signs of fatigue and despair on his mother's face, he held more grudges against his father, who left them and made them live in such conditions. Generally, housing projects like the one where Arthur and his mother used to live are places full of gangs and forbidden activities. Arthur grew up in this environment and made many bad friends. They formed small gangs and carried out some thefts from time to time. They used to rob stores or car parking counters and things like that. In 1987, when Arthur was 15 years old, he met an older man named Da Vinci. This man was one of his mother's friends, or let's say her secret lover. One day Arthur got arrested while he was trying to steal a car. Da Vinci was the one who went to the police station, paid the bail, and got him out. On their way back from the police station, Da Vinci told Arthur, if you want to become a robber, you have to follow the smartest ways, stay away from breaking counters and stealing cars and stores. You won't get anything. You need something better. Arthur asked Da Vinci, what do you mean? Da Vinci replied, come with me, I'll show you. Da Vinci took Arthur to an old building that seemed like a warehouse. They entered the building, took the creaky elevator and went down to the basement. The whole place was like a workshop. There were many machines, papers, ink, and many other kinds of stuff. Arthur walked in astonishingly. He first noticed the smell of ink, then asked Da Vinci, what is this place? Da Vinci said, just follow me. Then they went towards the machines and tools and started working. Arthur grabbed the papers, put in the ink and the molds, and turned on the machines. And that's when Arthur realized that Da Vinci was actually printing counterfeit money. This left Arthur stunned. The money that everyone is desperately looking for was literally produced in front of his eyes. Nearly every day, Da Vinci brought Arthur to the workshop, where he showed him the printing process, how to mix colors, how to create molds, and how to assign a unique serial number to each bill. Arthur was really impressed by the work. He liked the atmosphere and the artistic side of the counterfeit operation. Besides, Da Vinci became like his father. He loved and respected him so much. He considered him an idol. And of course, Arthur was so happy by the money that he got. 
The more money he printed, the more money he got from Da Vinci. It became a work for him. Things remained as they were for almost a year. Then Da Vinci vanished. He no longer came to Arthur's house. He didn't hear from him anymore. And whenever Arthur went to the workshop, he found it locked. This is how Da Vinci disappeared from his life. At the time, Arthur felt as though he had been abandoned twice, once by his biological father and once by the man who had shown him much love and respect. This feeling was extremely painful. At this point, Arthur decided to rejoin his friends and gang and resumed the theft operations once more. This was a mistake. Arthur had a relationship with a girl, which resulted in a pregnancy, and he had a son at the age of 17. He named him Arthur III. Arthur decided to take care of this boy, to be present in his life, and not abandon him as his father had. However, he needed to work harder in order to provide for his son and his son's mother. For this reason, Arthur and his friends invented a new trick to raise cash. This time, they decided to steal from the drug dealers. They disguised themselves in police uniforms and rode in a car like a police car. And because they were from the same neighborhood, they knew the drug dealers in person, so they pretty much had an idea about who might carry drugs with him. They would raid him and confiscate all his cash and drugs on the basis that they were the police. This, by the way, was not something strange to the police at the time, and everyone knew that many cops were corrupt. They could simply take the money and drugs that they confiscated for themselves, so everything that Arthur and his friends did was normal. Arthur and his friends kept repeating this for a while until they went through a dangerous experience. Once, while they were trying to do the same thing with one of the drug dealers, his gang members were close to him, so instead of giving up and giving them what he had, he called out to his friends, and they took out their weapons and started shooting Arthur and his gang. Each one of them immediately fled in a particular direction. Arthur kept running as he heard the gunshots next to him. All of a sudden, he got a bullet in his leg, fell down, and started bleeding and losing consciousness little by little. He felt like these were his last moments in life because he thought they were coming to kill him. But when he woke up in the hospital, he realized that the gang left him bleeding until the ambulance showed up. This was such a terrifying incident for Arthur. It pushed him to think about leaving Chicago and settling in Texas. This means that he is going to leave his son and his mother and abandon them, just like his father did. Arthur was scared and didn't feel safe in Chicago. So he went to Texas in 1993, where he tried to live an honorable life. He worked some hard jobs with a low salary, but he didn't quit. He wanted to change himself and start a new journey, leaving behind the past and his criminal background. During that period, Arthur got to know a girl named Natalie. He fell in love with her, and so did she. He proposed to her, and they got married. Arthur felt too safe with her that he told her about his past and what he used to do. He told her about the thefts the counterfeit, and everything. He first anticipated that she would react as follows. No, I can't live with you. You're a criminal and a forger. Instead, she told him that he was the kind of man she had been waiting for and that his criminal record had impressed her. She kept trying to convince him to go back to the counterfeit. She told him, if you have such skill, why don't you do it again? But this time you're going to work for yourself. We are going to be rich and will live a better life. Over time, Arthur got convinced and excited. He eventually took it seriously and planned carefully for this project. He first began by buying the printing machines, then he started to recall what he learned from Da Vinci during that year and began to print some bills as tests and made efforts to improve his work. He didn't accept anything but high quality. Little by little, Arthur began to print small quantities of counterfeit money because spending that money was harder than printing it. Even if it was hard to distinguish between counterfeit money and real one, it's still risky to spend it normally. This was one of the lessons that he learned from Da Vinci. He intended to increase the quantity, but he first wanted to make sure that everything was going great and no one could spot the difference. In 1996, an unpleasant awaited for Arthur and Natalie. 
That year, the U.S. government released a new $100 bill with numerous security features, making it even more complicated and challenging to counterfeit. Features such as the watermark that is visible when the bill is held up to a light source, the used ink that changes depending on the angle at which the bill is viewed, and the security tape that turns gray when exposed to ultraviolet light, the Federal Reserve System seal, and tiny writings known as microprinting printed on the bill, meaning that it would be extremely difficult to create a fake copy of this bill. Since counterfeiting was so common, the American government originally released this version specifically to limit it. However, Arthur did not despair. On the contrary, he got excited, taking it as a challenge. It's a new level that's completely different from the things that he learned from Da Vinci, but it's time for him to be the boss and make his own way. There were tools that did not exist in the days of Da Vinci. At that time, the use of computers and design programs began to spread, especially Photoshop, which was considered a revolutionary new technology. And Arthur was probably one of the first to use digital technologies to counterfeit money. Before designing and above all, the first thing Arthur needs is the printing paper. The paper must be identical to the paper used by the Federal Reserve because it is easy to check whether the paper is original or fake using a very simple trick that most cashiers use. He could simply bring a special type of pen and put a line on the paper. The line is supposed to be yellow, but on plain paper, this pen leaves a brown line. This was one of the new security features achieved by the chemicals used in the paper. The problem was that this type of paper was not available to the public. In fact, it was not paper. It was a mixture of cotton, linen, and various chemicals. How can one find a paper of this kind? Arthur and Natalie started ordering paper from all over the world. They tried several types of paper, and they spent a lot of time ordering paper and doing their tests. But all their experiments failed. It got to the point where Arthur began to feel desperate and frustrated. Natalie got mad at him and told him that she wouldn't let him give up. She took a big book that was next to her. It was a phone book. She lifted it up as if she would throw it on Arthur, and then she put it on a table. And while she was talking to Arthur, she drew a line on the book, and here was the surprise. The line was yellow. They looked at each other with shocked eyes, and then they screamed with happiness and excitement. Natalie tracked the company that printed the phone books and contacted them, posing as a teacher and had a project with her students, and she needed that kind of paper they told her that she could take as much as she wants because they had no idea that she intended to use that paper to counterfeit money. When Arthur received the paper, he was impressed by its quality. When he put two papers on top of each other, it was very close to the original money. So Arthur told Natalie that they could put the watermark and the safe tape between the two papers. The only big problem left is the ink that changes color. One day Arthur was walking down the street and saw a car dyed with a dye mixed between purple and green, and whenever Arthur moved, the car changed color just like the $100 bill. Arthur reached out to the company that makes car dye and eventually discovered that it was the same company that made ink for the U.S. government to print money. This means that they got to the source. They prepared everything, paper, ink, design, everything ready. Only the printing stage remains, and this stage needs a lot of work. Arthur knew that all the money bills were creamy green, and this color doesn't print by regular printers. This color needs a pressing machine to be printed, and the paper should be pressed several times to get the desired color, so they used to put the ink, the watermark, and the security tape on, and then they pressed for the first time. After that, they put the image in the middle and pressed it for the second time. And in the end, they put the seal and the serial number on and then pressed it for the third time. They even got a program designed to give a serial number to each bill automatically. All this made Arthur the greatest money forger in US history and maybe in the world. Arthur finally mastered the process. The result was insane and the bill was identical to the real one. His hard work and dedication paid off as he was able to replicate the exact same result as the original. Natalie made the decision to try it out for the first time. She went to a supermarket, made a small purchase of $10, 
and paid the cashier $100 to get the change, $90 in real dollars. Of course, the cashier first grabbed the special pen and drew a line on the paper. The line was yellow. Then he tilted and turned the bill over, and the ink really changed color. Next, he held the bill to the light, and he spotted the watermark. So he was pretty sure that it's a real bill, so he took it and gave her the change back. Natalie came out of the supermarket, and she was extremely happy. And when Arthur saw her, he realized that their money would take them to the next level. From that time, they began to print more counterfeit money. They used to print almost $50,000 monthly, but they were very careful in spending the money. It is true that their money was professionally forged, but they had to take their precautions. During the next year and a half, they would move from one place to another, print money and spend it in a certain place, and immediately after that they went to another place. That was the right time for money laundering. They used to buy things with their counterfeit money to get change in real and clean money. This way, they grew their fortune. And for youngsters 23 and 22 years old, life was like a dream. They were free to do whatever they wanted. They kept doing this to grow their work, printing more money to the point that they sometimes printed $30,000 a day. They got everything they need to the point that they don't know what to buy. So they used to buy kids clothes, pampers, and many other things, and gave it away to charities. They felt happier by doing such things. Years passed until 2000, when Arthur decided to go back to his hometown, Chicago, and of course, Natalie came along with him. For the past years, Arthur had provided for his son and his son's mother, but he hadn't seen his son for a long time who was at the time 10 years old. When Arthur started to take his son out with him and buy him toys and clothes and everything he wants, the son got attached more to his father, which helped to strengthen their relationship. At the same time, Arthur met again with his old friends, and he began to tell them about his new business. He told them he printed money and how much money he made out of this job. Then he showed them an example, and no one was able to tell the difference. Of course, Arthur told his friends about his work because he wanted them to work with him and help him because he used to print more than he could spend. He wanted to take advantage of his friend's network in large restaurants, nightclubs, and casinos so they could help him with the money laundering process. Actually, Arthur's money had spread almost everywhere. Even the FBI began to pay attention to this counterfeit money with high professionalism. They considered it the best counterfeit version of the dollar in the whole market. The amount that Arthur was actually able to print was much higher than the spread amount of his money. This prompted Arthur to work with gangs. It was easier for him to sell $100,000 of his counterfeit money for $30,000 than spend it and launder it on his own. He simply used to sell the money to gangs and they would get rid of it. Arthur knew he was entering a dangerous world when he started working with these gangs, so he made sure to take extra precautions. He dealt with Russian gangs, the Italian mafia, and many other criminals. Everywhere Arthur goes, he first looks around to see if anyone is spying on him through covert microphones. Arthur has become obsessed with almost everything. He became so paranoid that he always brought a detector when he went to meet someone. He was unprepared for any risk, and he remained in this situation for years. In 2002, one day, one of the Russian gangs that Arthur used to work with invited him to a party in which there were all kinds of drugs, and Arthur carried a sum of his counterfeit money. He was supposed to give that money to the Russian gang. The party was in a nightclub at a hotel, so there were many ordinary people, let alone the hotel workers. The gang booked several rooms in that hotel. One of them was Arthur's room. Arthur went up to his room to take a rest with a suitcase full of counterfeit money. It had almost $60,000 in it and some drugs gifted from his Russian friends. Half an hour later, he heard knocks on the door and someone said, police, open the door. He opened the door and immediately the police raided the room carrying their weapons and started asking him about the drugs. Arthur denied that he had drugs, but there was some of it on the bedside table. The police searched the room and found the suitcase, and here is where Arthur got worried. 
Unfortunately for him, one of the officers had experience with money. At first, they thought this was drug money, but when the officer was counting the money, he felt something weird. So they arrested him and confiscated the drugs and money as proof. Arthur felt like this was the end. The police will then discover that the money was counterfeit, which of course is a bigger federal crime than drug possession. When the police started the investigation procedure, Arthur got a lawyer. So he came to him and showed him the police report, which said that during his arrest, the door to the room was open and that the police saw drugs on the bedside table and that is why they broke into the room and searched it. Arthur told the lawyer that this was impossible. The corridor was long and no one standing at the door could see the bedside table. The lawyer made a case cancellation request on the basis that the break-in operation was illegal and unauthorized, and its reason had already been proven untrue. And due to the illegality of the inspection process, the judge ordered the case to be dismissed. Following all of this, Arthur's level of fear grew. He was aware that the FBI would be keeping an eye on him because they knew that he was in possession of counterfeit money. Arthur decided to stop printing and all of his other activities, in addition to his dealings with gangs. Nevertheless, Arthur remained in a panic about everything, feeling that he needed something new to change his life. So he started trying to look for his father who left him and his mother when he was 11 years old. And after searching, he was able to find someone in Alaska who had the name of his father. He wrote him a letter and sent it in the mail, and his father called him back. And they talked for about an hour after they decided they should meet. Arthur took the plane and flew to his father. When Arthur first saw his father, he had mixed feelings. He was happy to see his father for the first time, but he also felt discontent toward him for abandoning him when he was a young child with his struggling mother. During the next days, Arthur and his father kept talking to each other almost all the time. His father asked for an apology since he was in a dark time when he left them and had several psychological crises. This made Arthur close to his father and feel more comfortable to the point that he decided to tell him about the counterfeit money that he made. His father kept listening to him and seemed interested. One day later, the father came to Arthur and told him that he was going through a hard period with no money and that he was not doing well in his work. So he asked Arthur if he could just print some money for him. Arthur was surprised by his father's words and told him, I told you that I was arrested and was about to be imprisoned, and you are asking me to print money for you. His father replied in an effort to persuade him, you have a talent and it should be used for our sake. If you are afraid of the police, no one knew about you here in Alaska, so you have nothing to worry about and I am ready to help you. Arthur at first was afraid, but at the same time, he wanted to see the pride in his father's eyes. So he decided to reprint again. Arthur used to hide some paper and the printing machines in a warehouse in Chicago. He asked his friends to ship them for him to Alaska. He then received the shipment and started preparing the printing workshop with his father. This experience brought them closer together. Arthur was happy to show his father his job, and he was proud of the level he had reached. But this time, the outcome wasn't good. It wasn't bad either, but it was lower compared to previous versions in terms of quality. Arthur told his father that this should be kept a secret between them and that they should first test the money, just as he already did with Natalie, before spending it normally. His father, although he showed understanding, did the exact opposite. The first thing he did, he told his wife Annis, and then he gave her $3,000 to spend and launder. Annis, in turn, gave a portion of the money to a couple of their neighbors to spend it and launder it. Those foolish people, when they got the money and saw that it was almost identical to the real one, preferred not to launder it, claiming that nobody could know whether it was counterfeit or real money. So they spent it normally. They didn't even change it for real money. All of them, the father, the wife, and the neighbors. Arthur, although he had no idea about what was going on, he felt that his father was acting strange. And when he asked him about the money he had, his father would avoid the answer and change the subject. When Arthur saw that things were not going well, he decided to stop printing and leave Alaska. Arthur spoke to his father and told him that he was no longer comfortable printing money. 
and that he was leaving. His father did not try to convince him to stay, on the contrary. He let him go because he had already learned the printing process and intended to continue on his own. Arthur left Alaska, and this was a move in his favor because the couple to whom Annis gave the money were spending it normally. They went to a shop and bought things from it. They paid with counterfeit money. When the cashier first saw the money and knew that it was counterfeit, he immediately called the police and they were both arrested. The couple was recruited as police informants to find the person printing the money, and eventually, the police managed to arrest Arthur's father and his wife. The police seized a recorded call with their neighbors admitting to forgery and all the details. Imagine when the police investigate Annis, she spilled the beans and told them about Arthur and that he was with them. And as soon as Arthur came back to his wife, Natalie in Texas, the FBI and special forces raided his house, but Arthur was careful and knew very well what he was doing. He didn't keep anything in his house. All he had was a quantity of counterfeit money, and he hid it in plastic cans and buried it in the woods. But he was arrested, though, because of his stepmother's witness. In the end, Arthur's father received a five-year prison sentence. Arthur took three years. He received a lower sentence than his father, even though he was the mastermind, because his father was arrested in the middle of the operation, and Arthur was sentenced because of the testimony of his father's wife. Annis and the neighbors were released because they cooperated with the police. Arthur went to prison and spent two years and a half there. This was one of the most difficult periods of his life because of his separation from his son and wife. All this made him reflect on his life and the things that brought him to this place. He made a promise to himself that he would leave the world of crime forever this time, and he was only waiting for the day of his release from prison to start a new life. The day he was released, an unexpected thing happened. Imagine that on the day that he got out, his father died in prison. This was very tough for him. On the day that he got ready to start a new phase of life, he got such unexpected news. Despite the fact that his father left him at an early age with his mother struggling for good living conditions, Arthur got so much love for his father. His father's death had a great impact on him. He had no one else in his life but his son, Arthur III. In 2004, Arthur went back to Chicago to stay close to his son who was 15 years old at the time and spend more time with him. Arthur tried to get his normal life back. He worked several jobs. He worked as a waiter in a restaurant, bathroom cleaner, jobs that were part-time and temporary with low salaries. He really passed through a very hard time, especially since he provided for his son and his son's mother. He still had counterfeit money buried in the woods, as I mentioned before, but he didn't want to use it to avoid ruining his life once more unless his son needed something. He made an effort to repair his relationship with his son and make up for the years that had passed, and he was successful in doing so. Their relationship experienced a notable improvement. In 2005, the well-known magazine Rolling Stone published an article about Arthur and dubbed him the greatest money forger in the world. They mentioned that he forged more than $10 million. His son was reading the article, but he didn't really believe that then he asked his father, and the latter replied, Yes, I did it. During the previous long years, I think I have reached that figure, or maybe even more. His son was too affected by the article and its details to the extent that he decided to try. And since intelligence is not inherited, his son scanned money and printed it with his printer in his room. Arthur Ayoye's mother, when she saw what her son was doing, immediately called his father and told him that his son was printing money in his room. Arthur felt guilty and even ashamed because the published article showed him to be brilliant, even though he was a criminal, and he did not think that his answer to his son's question would make him think about following in his path. Arthur immediately came back home, went to his son's room, and found him printing a $20 bill with his own printer. At the time, the son was really going through a tough period of his life. He was using some types of drugs and had some psychological troubles. So the father suddenly came in and started shouting at him, telling him that there was no need to do this because he was providing for him. And the son told him that he was free to do whatever he wanted. 
and their voices began to get louder on each other. The son took the money that was printed and ran outside the house. His father ran after him, and they continued their screaming and fighting in front of the people in the street. In a moment of anger, the son threw his money at Arthur, unfortunately for them. At that moment, a police car was passing by the street by accident. The police stopped them to check what was going on, and Arthur immediately went down to the ground to collect money, and he assured the police officer that everything was all right. He told him that it was just a small conflict with his son, which he was dealing with. The police officer asked Arthur about his name, checked his identity, and called for backup. A few moments later, the street was already cordoned off by the FBI and police. Arthur had been handcuffed, and after getting the money and proof, they took Arthur to the FBI facility, where one of the biggest officers came to him and told him, Look, we don't really care about these $20, but these $100 that were in your pocket looks familiar to us. This was some of the counterfeit money that he was still using when he was in need. The first time Arthur got arrested, he was issued three years in prison because of a lack of evidence, but this time he got arrested and accused of the same accusation, and it was proved. Eventually, he got a nine-year prison sentence. As Arthur III, his son, was taken to a juvenile detention center for a couple of months, the FBI tried to make him a witness against his father, but he refused. After being imprisoned for the second time, Arthur experienced extreme desperation. He felt like he was the biggest loser in the world and was unable to make things right with his father or son. At that moment, he felt as though he no longer wanted to live. As for his son, he returned to live with his mother, but they were not compatible at all, so he left the house and lived alone. During the years that followed, he spent all his time forging money. Although his money wasn't that perfect, it was like a scanned copy of a bill but he had clients, he worked hard to improve the outcome. He got better tools, he just wanted to follow his father's path. So he made a workshop, brought the machines and printers, and many developed tools. Then he began to get more orders. The printers were almost working all night. But one day, in 2009, he was 18 at the time. He was working on one of the biggest orders. All of a sudden, a bunch of FBI agents raided the workshop. He was caught red-handed. When his father heard the news, he was shocked. His son had gone to prison for money forgery too, and he felt like he was guilty of that. Arthur submitted a request to be transferred to his son's prison, and a month later the request was approved. Arthur was happy and excited that he will meet his son again, and during the years they spent there they became friends, they were always together talking about their futures and ambitions and what they will do after prison. As for Arthur, he dreamed to be an artist. He used to paint when he was in prison. When he got released in 2015, he started working in the artistic field. All his works were a reflection of his life and his experience in forgery. He took advantage of the security features that were in the money and used them in his works. Arthur's works were worth forty and fifty thousand dollars, and his life changed completely. Instead of counterfeiting the hundred dollars, he would make one painting with a hundred thousand dollars and sell it. The moral of the story is that individuals can succeed if their skills and abilities are effectively directed.